The River Thames has always been linked to tales of the supernatural, from shadowy figures lurking beneath its surface to apparitions appearing on its bridges and banks, numerous ghost stories have emerged over the years. As we travel from the bridge at Clifton Hamden along to the historic village of Wargrave, we'll delve into some of the ghostly tales from this beautiful but dangerous waterway. Clifton Hamden Bridge is a Grade 2 listed building just north of Clifton Lock. The current bridge was built in 1867 and replaced a local ferry service which had operated on the site since the 14th century. It was designed by prolific Gothic revival architect George Gilbert Scott who designed many notable structures including the Midland Grand Hotel the Albert Memorial and St Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh. The red brick structure has six Gothic arches and in 1931 the bridge faced demolition by the council who wanted to replace it with a steel beam and trestle bridge. Had the bridge been demolished, would it have lost the ghostly young man who is seen on the bridge itself and on the land just next to the Barley Mow pub. Descriptions of the young man vary, but he's witnessed sitting on the brickwork, swaying his legs, looking quite happily at the River Thames. Some say he wears a dark tweed suit and a cap, others say he carries a school satchel. He has been witnessed falling forward from the bridge, but is not seen entering the water itself. Is he the same young lad who is sometimes seen and heard fishing on the approach to the bridge next to the Barley Mow pub? This well-known riverside tavern is over 650 years old and famous patrons included Charles Dickens and Jerome K. Jerome. The young man's identity is unclear, but we do know that the River Thames at Clifton Hamden has taken the lives of many unfortunate souls, including that of 14-year-old Herbert Bowron in 1894. On the 27th of July, during the summer holidays, Herbert and several of his friends arrived from Fulham for a two-week fishing trip and were lodging in the village. It was an area the boys knew well, they spent their days fishing and boating on the stretch of river near the bridge. On the 2nd of August, after dinner at their lodgings, Herbert and his friend Edgar took their fishing rods and walked towards the bridge. After an hour of unsuccessful fishing, Edgar decided to head back. He left Herbert fishing from the bridge. At 10 o'clock, Herbert had not arrived home. Concerns began to grow, the lock keeper and local vicar were informed and the river was searched on both sides of the bridge. Roughly 30 minutes later, a lifeless body was located in four feet of water, 40 yards from the bridge, where Herbert was last seen. His friends were able to confirm that it was Herbert. He had no injuries or bruises, he was fully dressed except for his cap, and the fishing rod he carried was never found. Had Herbert deliberately entered the river, or could he have slipped or fallen by accident? His friends explained that a few weeks earlier, Herbert had tripped and fallen whilst at home in Fulham. He'd hit his head and had been treated for concussion at St George's Hospital in Tooting. Earlier in the day, whilst the friends were fishing on the banks of the Thames, Herbert, who was unable to swim, said that he dreamed about swimming and that he wanted to enter the water. 
His friends managed to explain that this was a bad idea, but it seems curiosity and the lure of the River Thames may have prevailed, leading to the death of Herbert Bowron at just 14. Just 10 years earlier, in September 1884, the river at Clifton Hamden claimed the lives of two men from Didcot who got into trouble on a rowing trip. William Townsend, who worked at Didcot Station, and William Peacock, a farm labourer, both aged 20, hired a rowing skiff for a spot of fishing with two more friends. They entered the Thames between Abingdon and Clifton Hamden, past the Barley Mow and travelled under the bridge. As they made their way towards Burcott, the men decided to swap seats so that Townsend and Peacock could take over the rowing. As the men stood to move across, the skiff capsized. Both Peacock and Townsend disappeared beneath the water and were unable to be saved. The other two companions were able to survive. An hour later, the body of Townsend was retrieved using a boat hook, followed by the body of Peacock. Could the ghostly young man on the bridge be William Townsend, William Peacock or Herbert Bowron? who drowned so tragically in this most scenic part of the Thames. Around 15 miles from Clifton Hamden lies Basildon Park. This Grade 1 listed building was built between 1776 and 1783, but was never completed. It was commissioned for Sir Francis Sykes, who made a fortune with the British East India Company, although he went on to lose his wealth and status rather publicly. The building has a turbulent past and is said to be haunted by several different apparitions. The building changed hands many times, and by 1914, the semi-derelict building was used as a convalescent hospital. In 1929, it narrowly avoided being dismantled brick by brick and being rebuilt in America. However, a fireplace, mirrors and paintings from the dining room were sold off and are located in the Basildon Room in the Waldorf Astoria in New York. In World War II, the house was used for troops, prisoners of war, and the 400-acre park was used as a tank training area. By the 1950s, the house was facing demolition, but thankfully the property was purchased, lovingly restored, and was donated to the National Trust. The building is said to be haunted by the angry spirit of Sir Francis Sykes, the third baronet, who inherited the property at the age of five. By this time, there was little money in the family's succession and the property was already mortgaged. The family finances were drained further by Sykes's lavish lifestyle and association with the Prince Regent, who decided to occupy a range of rooms in Basildon when Sykes was just 14 years old. By the late 1820s, Sykes was suffering serious financial issues and in 1829, Basildon Park was on the market. There was little interest in the house, as Sykes refused to accept any price less than £100,000. During this period, the house was often let, in an effort to claw back much-needed funds. Sykes and his family occupied the property between 1834 and 1835, when the future Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli was a house guest at Basildon. Disraeli was having an affair with Sykes's wife, Henrietta, and went on to immortalise her, along with some descriptions of Basildon and its rooms, in his novel, Henrietta Temple. Henrietta Sykes was also conducting an affair 
with the painter Daniel McLeese. This resulted in humiliation for Sykes, who publicly denounced McLeese, creating an unacceptable high society scandal. He threatened divorce and published an announcement that he would not pay off his wife's debts. Consequently, Charles Dickens, a friend of McLeese, then writing Oliver Twist, based his wicked and cruel character Bill Sykes on Sir Francis. In 1838, just as Oliver Twist was published, Sir Francis, financially broke and publicly humiliated, finally sold Basildon Park for £97,000. Five years later, Sykes died at the age of 43. During renovations, poltergeist activity occurred inside the property, with objects being moved and found elsewhere. However, this has not been witnessed for many years. Visitors and staff occasionally report cold spots and hearing an angry male voice shouting, as if in a heated argument. Loud bangs and slamming doors suggest a turbulent spirit roams the property's corridors and some visitors report unpleasant whispering in their ear, usually telling them to leave. Is this the angry spirit of Francis Sykes, whose anger and bitterness is still evident today? Could this be the apparition of a valet or a member of staff from many years ago? Around half a mile to the west of the village of Lower Basildon, on the bank of the River Thames itself, stands the ruined Basildon Grotto. This once beautiful building is now derelict, but rumours still circulate that it is paranormally active. The original grotto was built around 1720 for Lady Mary Fane, who lived at the Great House of Basildon Park. The grotto itself was located next to a small house built by her husband, Charles Fane, for her to use as a place of retirement. It consisted of an elaborate shell room with a separate rock chamber where running water fed into a pool. Construction of the grotto cost £5,000, a significant amount, and three times as much as the house. During the Second World War, the grotto was a base for the land army. The Fanes Manor was demolished when the current house was built by the Sykes family. The grotto is the only lasting link to the Fanes. Lady Fane died in 1762, according to legend, by drowning in a well within the house. Her only son died just four years later. It is thought that over the centuries, the restless spirit of Lady Fane has made regular appearances at the grotto. The apparition is said to emerge from a fireplace in a certain room and was witnessed many times in the late 1800s. More recent sightings have been of a silvery white transparent form gliding up the staircase and brushing past observers. She is usually witnessed around four o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes she is witnessed drifting across the lawn towards the river. The original story behind the haunting appears to have been lost to time. A member of the Women's Land Army stationed at the grotto in 1943 reported seeing a ghost in the house, though she described her appearance as being more like a serving girl rather than Lady Fane herself. A young woman with long copper-coloured hair dressed in a flowing pale green dress was observed at least twice gliding slowly along the corridor towards the blue bathroom. Others have also seen her, including members of staff who worked in the offices in the building in the 1960s. Several people seem to witness the same thing, a white transparent lady passing them on the stairs. In the 1980s, two boys reported seeing the spectre drifting from the grotto down to the River Thames before slowly vanishing. 
Others have reported door handles rattling, doors opening at night, footsteps and disconnected servant bells ringing. In 2007, the offices had gone and the property was sold to a new owner. In 2017, planning permission was granted to develop the site into a 53-room hotel with a luxurious spa, two detached houses and leisure facilities. In March 2021, a serious blaze tore through the property and its future is now uncertain. An inn has been located on this site since 1293. In the 16th century, the inn underwent remodelling and was renamed the George. This inn has always been extremely popular. It was a significant stop for those travelling between London and the West Country, including Bath and Bristol. Not only is the building said to be cursed, it is also said to be home to a resident ghost. The building sits on the junction of the River Pang and the River Thames, and subsequently, this area of Pangbourne, including the hotel's cellars, used to flood quite regularly. In 1603, the decision was made to fill in the cellars permanently. As workmen prepared the area, they made a startling discovery. Deep within the dark and rat-infested cellar was a barely recognisable woman, dressed in ragged clothing, who appeared to be bleeding from the mouth. She shouted at the men to leave her be. The men, startled and afraid, left the cellar to consult the owners about their findings. Strangely, the owners knew about the woman, she was identified as a local witch named Betty Price, and for some time she had lived in the cellars, surviving by consuming the rats that existed in the cellars alongside her. In 1603, being accused of witchcraft was very serious, and in nearby Windsor and Abingdon, only 24 years earlier, four women were tried and executed for sorcery, a trial known as the Windsor Witches. There are two versions of how the story ends. Some say Price was evicted, arrested and taken to the Assizes. She was found guilty and sentenced to hang at Abingdon. Some say she called on the spirits and died suddenly in the cellars at the George, refusing to leave. Both versions say that before she expired, she placed a curse on the owners of the building and on the building itself. The vengeful apparition of Betty has been seen walking through the corridors of the hotel, dripping wet and leaving a disgusting stench as she passes. Wet and dirty footprints have been seen and felt on the carpet and bare floors of the inn. She appears as a dark shadow, human in shape but not solid. Some believe she knocks on the doors and laughs as disturbed sleepers look along the empty corridor. A number of unfortunate incidents have been experienced at the hotel over the years, and some believe this is due to Betty's curse. In the early 1900s, a London to Oxford mail coach overturned just outside the inn, causing the driver to have a nasty head injury. The incident was caused when overhead telegraph wires suddenly broke and landed in the street. Unable to stop in time, the horse ran into the sharp wires and sustained life-changing injuries. On New Year's Eve in 1924, whilst the hotel was empty and in between owners, a brutal fire took hold in the bar and was spotted by a passerby. So intense was this blaze that the press described the George Hotel as practically demolished. Curiously, there was nobody on the premises at the time. The inn was locked and secured. 
Could this devastating event be the work of Betty Price? In 1951, another serious fire broke out in the hotel, severely damaging some of the structures and slightly injuring four firemen. Luckily, nobody was killed. It appears that the fire and subsequent rebuilding of the hotel in 1951 has caused much of the paranormal activity at the George to stop. But is Betty Price still lurking somewhere in the fabric of this famous coaching inn? Maple Durham House is an Elizabethan stately home in Oxfordshire on the bank of the River Thames. It was constructed in 1585, and despite its beautiful appearance and immaculate grounds, this magnificent house has a dark past. Historically, the house is one of Catholic England's best-kept secrets. The owners went to great trouble to keep its Catholic allegiance a secret during times of persecution, and its numerous priest holes were a safe haven for many. Its riverside location was crucial. Fugitives could arrive by boat without riding through the village or being spotted by a stranger. Priest holes are still being discovered and in 2002 one was found hidden beneath a sliding fireplace in a remote upper bedroom. The family would also celebrate mass with an altar concealed inside a writing desk. Legend suggests that a murder took place here around the time of the Civil War. The house was a royalist stronghold, and Henry Blount, it is said, flew into a fit of rage and murdered one of his servants. He hid the body in a priest hole at Maple Durham. Whether he got away with murder or not is unknown, but it seems his restless spirit still remains at the property today. Visitors and owners report seeing a man dragging the body of the unfortunate servant across the floor, perhaps attempting to conceal the corpse once more. This story has been told for centuries, but seemed to experience a resurgence during the Victorian times. Are the stories genuine, or part of the Victorian obsession with all things Gothic? Another location at Maple Durham that's said to be haunted is the mill. The mill at Maple Durham is the only mill on the River Thames that still works, producing stone ground flour. It was built in the 15th century and was extended many times. The mill is said to be haunted by the figure of a man who emerges from the shadows wearing old-fashioned work clothes. For some reason, he appears to be headless. Local legend says this is the ghost of Henry Corduroy, who worked at the mill for many years in the 1830s. A baker by trade, Henry Corduroy was well known in the area and would deliver bread from Maple Durham Mill to his customers on a regular basis. On Wednesday the 12th of June, 1839, Henry returned home and was met by his wife, who was angry and upset. She began to accuse Henry of having an affair after she found two letters addressed to him, written by another married woman in the village. The argument escalated. Henry proceeded to his bureau, took out a pistol and fired at his wife. The bullet entered under her right eye and she was in a critical condition for many months before she passed away. On the 22nd of February, 1840, Henry Corduroy was charged with shooting with intent. He was transported to Tasmania in December, 1840 for life, leaving his nine children behind. Could his apparition haunt the mill? Is the apparition that of a different person, perhaps somebody killed in an unfortunate accident? We may never know.
Wargrave is a small historic village on the banks of the River Thames in Berkshire. The stretch of river at Wargrave is well known for rowing, and the Wargrave and Ship Lake Regatta takes place annually here and has done since 1867. The village itself has several ghosts, and it seems the river at Wargrave is also reputedly haunted. The Bull at Wargrave is a 15th century former coaching inn. This popular pub, with its wooden beams and fireplaces, retains its traditional features. For centuries, the Bull and the nearby St George and Dragon were used as locations for inquests when people passed away in the village or were pulled from the Thames, as Wargrave did not have its own mortuary. One of the upstairs rooms, used for accommodation, is said to be haunted by a distraught weeping woman. This story dates back many years, to 1820, when the landlord discovered his wife was having a clandestine affair with a young man. He evicted his wife, forbidding her to set foot over the threshold again. She begged and begged to see her young baby again, but her husband refused. She is said to have died of a broken heart. The weeping woman is thought to be a friendly ghost, but sometimes she throws glasses across the pub and taps people on the shoulder, especially when they're waiting to be served. Another phantom at the bull is that of a cat who roams the building and is sometimes seen by staff and guests. Patrons have felt the cat walk across their feet and nuzzle their legs. When preparing the bedrooms, staff have witnessed marks on the bed linen, indentations on the bedding, despite the door being closed and locked. Further along the high street is the St George and Dragon, a riverside pub which is extremely popular with boaters and tourists due to its prime riverside location. This stretch of water used to be the location of a small ferry and is said to be haunted by an evil river spirit. A disproportionate number of fatal incidents have taken place here and some say faces and voices are seen and heard in the water. In 1878, the Thames froze and people flocked to the river to skate upon its frozen surface. On the 25th of January, 1879, Colonel Markham of Shiplake House and his daughter had been skating at Wargrave. They hailed the ferry to drop them home just upstream and the ferryman, Essex Thomas, keeper of Shiplake Lock, arrived with his 10-year-old daughter, Mary, who was keeping her father company. The passengers boarded and the ferry made its way along the river. As they approached Shiplake House, the bow of the boat got onto the ice and the stern tilted downward. The boat took on water at a rapid pace and all four occupants fell in. Miss Markham, Colonel Markham and Mr Thomas all survived, but Mary drowned. When the boat was recovered, Mary's body was found. Her clothes had become entangled in the boat and she'd been unable to surface. In July 1926, a young woman who'd had dinner at the pub was rescued from the Thames at Wargrave. She was just about breathing and managed to survive the ordeal. When asked what happened, she described being drawn to the river by the sound of a child singing. She approached the water's edge, looked down to see a child's face that seemed to beckon her to enter the water. That was all she could remember. Fortunately, two boaters were able to rescue her but many others have not been so lucky. I hope you enjoyed listening to some more stories from the River Thames. There will be more to come as we head through towards Windsor, Richmond and London. You may recognise some of the locations from this video, from film and television, 
So Maple Durham Mill was used in The Eagle Has Landed, and it was also used on the cover of a Black Sabbath album in 1970. Basildon Park was used in Downton Abbey, and it was also used in Bridgerton. It also featured in the film Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which is not a film that I have seen. If you watched Ghost of the River Thames Part 1, you might remember that I included a story from a viewer named Chris, and his great-grandmother worked as a servant at the manor house at Clifton Hamden in the 1920s, and she reported some odd events that happened whilst she was employed there. And that's the house that is currently owned by Kay Bush. I haven't been able to find any ghost stories connected to the house, but it does. that's probably because it exists as a private home. But I did find out that a servant named Emily Harvey was killed in a car crash nearby in 1914. This story was published in the press. Considering how tiny this village is, I'm sure it would have been a, t a dreadful shock to everybody living nearby. The incident occurred on the Cullen Bridge. Emily and her friend were in a car being driven by a man named Walter, and all three of them were employed at Clifton Hamden Manor House. Both Emily and her friend were thrown into the Thames when the car steering failed as the car went round a corner. Emily drowned and her body was recovered and she was just 21 years old. So could it be that Emily returns to Clifton Hamden? I don't know, but it was really quite a surprise to find this story. But to me, the activity that was described seemed a bit more childlike, I suppose. I wanted to include the old jail at Abingdon, hoping that it might be a place open to the public, but sadly it's not anymore. But I'll give you a bit of an overview. The building is right next to the bridge over the Thames and it was built by prisoners from Oxford Prison in 1811. And it only served as a prison until 1868 because by that time Reading had a bigger prison and that became the main prison for the area. But apparently it was the first prison with wings, first jail with wings. After it closed it was used as a grain storage facility for a while. It was converted into a leisure centre in the 1970s. That is when it seems the hauntings really began. The staff would hear quite aggressive voices whisper obscene things at them. They'd witness baskets of clothes in the changing rooms being thrown and chucked about. And there'd be shadowy figures who would appear in the corners and it would really frighten the staff and the customers. And it transpired that they built this sort of health suite, which was located on the site of the prison chapel. This is where the condemned were given their last rites. One of the ill-fated prisoners was a boy named John Dean, and he was only eight years old. He is believed to be the youngest person to be hanged in British criminal history. He'd been found guilty of arson at the Abingdon Assizes. He set fire to two outhouses belonging to this hotel in Windsor. The judge accused the boy of malice, revenge and cunning when he was sentenced. He was hanged in 1629, nearly 200 years before the jail was constructed, but the staff at the leisure centre were completely convinced that they could hear a child laughing at them when they locked up. So whether John Dean could have lived on the premises before it was a jail or knew the area, I don't think we'll ever know, but I thought it was quite an interesting story. Just across the road from the old jail, there's a pub with a really peculiar name. It's called The Broad Face. And I found out from this article that says, the pub which overlooks the site of the old gallows is said to have got its name from the hangings as the victim's face swelled up when the noose tightened. And I suppose that was because this was before the days of the long drop technique of execution. So maybe the location of the gallows is where Costa Coffee is today. Now the jail has been turned into flats and I wonder if the residents of the flats experience any strange happenings. I must be honest I am not sure about the idea of living in a converted prison but I suppose people want riverside views and proximity to London and you know actually I think I could live with that kitchen.
Sadly, I don't have any postcards for you today for this episode, but when I do the next episode of the River Thames, there's plenty of postcards. Thank you for watching. Hope you're really well. Take care and I'll see you on the next one.